Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, again, bringing you another fascinating guest today involved in creating a better tomorrow for so many people out there. Uh, today, we have a real rock star of the, uh, the biotech uh, domain with us. Uh, honored to be joined by none other than Dr. Lee Hood, uh, co-founder, chief strategy officer, and professor uh, at the Institute of Systems Biology in Seattle, as well as the chief executive officer of Phenome Health, a really interesting new nonprofit uh, organization dedicated to delivering value through health innovation focused on Dr. Hood's uh, P4 model of health, that is predictive, preventative, personalized, and participatory health, uh, taking into account uh, each patient's individual individuality. Uh, Dr. Hood is a world-renowned scientist and recipient of the National Medal of Science. Uh, he co-founded the Institute of Systems Biology back in 2000 and served as its first president in 2017. Uh, in 2016, in their uh, affiliation with Providence St. Joseph's Health, uh, he also took on roles as senior vice president and chief science officer of that organization. Uh, Dr. Hood's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, and National Academy of Medicine, and one of only 20 people ever to be elected to uh, to all three institutes. Uh, Dr. Hood received his medical degree from Johns Hopkins uh, School of Medicine, his PhD in biochem from Caltech, uh, and was a faculty member at Caltech uh, from 1967 to 1992, uh, serving for 10 years as the chair of biology. And during that period, uh, he and his team were responsible for the development of numerous uh, technologies for sequencers, synthesizer instruments that ultimately paved the way for the human genome projects, uh, successful mapping, understanding of the human genome, uh, and he and his students helped decipher many of the complex mechanisms of antibody diversification. In 1992, he founded and chaired the Department of Molecular Biotechnology at the University of Washington, the first academic department devoted to uh, cross-disciplinary biology. Uh, Dr. Hood has founded close to 20 biotech companies uh, and counting, including Amgen, Applied Biosciences, Rosetta, and Aravel. Um, and his new book, uh, amongst his others, The Age of Scientific Wellness, Why the Future of Medicine is Personalized, Predictive, Data-Rich, and in Your Hands, uh, now available uh, at all major booksellers. We're honored to have him with us today. Dr. Lee Hood, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Pleasure to be here. Um it's it's great having you. Uh, you know, the, the last time we chatted, which was about three years ago or so, you know, we were discussing uh, your P four model. We were obviously discussing systems biology and these unique networks uh, that uh, emerge from uh, these complex molecular machinery uh, called our genes. It seems in the last couple of years, though, things have really uh, amped up uh, uh, in, in the concept of you know, what you're bringing to us today in this in this phenome uh, concept or basically is merging everything that you, you've been doing the last couple of decades with these new tools like the artificial intelligence, like the digital twinning, all with bringing us sort of this new picture, these uh, trajectories as you talk about them, these networks of networks that really uh, define our life uh, and our life course, health, disease, and so forth. Introduce us, if you would, for a little while to the concept of the phenome. Okay. The uh, So the idea of the phenome is it is a means of measuring you at different stages of your life. Think about the change in your appearance from infancy to uh, youngster to adult to, and when you age. Each of those represents at a point in time, the phenome. And the way we measure the phenome is to look 
at the blood. It's a window into health and disease. It bathes all organs. They secrete molecules into the blood. And we can quantify those molecules and they give us insights into how healthy or non-healthy your organs are. So it's truly a window into disease. And of course, the microbiome, the gut, the, the microbes that are present in your gut are an terribly important aspect of health. And there we can analyze the different types of molecular species that are there. And we use digital health measurements for both body, the Fitbit, and brain. Uh, a, a, an approach called brain age Q, which we can talk about later. So all of these measurements come together in a sense to make you who you are at these different instances in your life. And in fact, your phenome is the convergence of three important aspects of your life, your genome, your personal behavior, and your environment. Those three together really make you what you are. And for different diseases, different states of wellness, different of those three uh, things can play important roles and so forth. So the phenome is nothing more than measurements of the body that give us deep insights into who and what you are at a given instance in time. And, you know, it's... Um... It's quite fascinating. You know, I was taking a look in sort of the numerous uh, you know papers that you've written on, on what you've been up to in in terms of uh, looking at the phenomes and different diseases in terms of aging. And I thought it'd be fun to to take a walk through some of these to really look at the uh, the extent and sort of the the really deep dive you're going into. Um, and I thought a, a, an interesting paper to start with would be uh, October 2020 from Nature uh, entitled Untargeted Longitudinal Analysis of Wellness Cohort Identifies uh, Markers of Metastatic Cancer Years Prior to Diagnosis. And here again, we have uh, clearly, uh, you know, several trends coming together. One, uh, of course, although genes tell us certain things about the world of oncology, that they don't tell the whole story. Uh, we know that prevention and, and getting cancer early is important. And here in this paper, you analyze literally over a thousand proteins, again, across time, across cancers, looking at things, looking at markers well ahead of time, some that may not be associated with breast cancer or lung cancer, pancreatic cancer previously, um, that again, tell this story, this evolving network story of no problem, today, but maybe in a couple of years. Take us through this paper, if you would like. Okay, let me give you the background on this paper, yeah. uh, because it's very important. Yeah. In 2015, we started a company called Aerovale. Yep. And the idea was to bring scientific or quantitative wellness to individuals to optimize their health. Part of that was to carry out these phenome measurements every six months. And uh, the Aerovale lasted about a four-year period. So we had we had these four-year transition points of phenome health every six, I mean, the phenome every six months. So we had an enormous amount of data on these patients. Well, what happened with these patients was really fascinating. In looking at them generally, it turned out of 5,000 patients, 167 transitioned from wellness to a chronic disease. In fact, 35 of them transitioned to cancer. And in fact, the first patient that we had of this type, which we called Eve, was a woman who was diagnosed in 2017 with stage four pancreatic cancer, which is really a, a, a disastrous cancer. What we did was then to go back and look at the blood samples that we'd stored in a biobank, taken six months apart prior to the time of her diagnosis. And these went back for about two years. And what we were able to find was there were five proteins that whose expression levels were way off scale that indicated the transition of this disease at an early stage 
up to two years prior to the, the diagnosis, the official diagnosis of the disease. And the really exciting possibility that opened up is if that was true of all these cancers, would we be able then to start therapeutic approaches to reverse the cancer at this mm -hmm. earliest stage when it was simple and the networks hadn't been badly disease perturbed and so forth. So what we did next was look at 10 additional pa patients that transitioned to cancer. And in each case, we saw these markers that came up years before the cancer was manifest clinically and so forth. So it seemed to be every cancer we looked at, we saw this kind of transition. So it really does open up the possibility of a really exciting future because Phenome Health, the nonprofit company I started about two years ago, is pushing the idea that we should have a second genome project where the government will help us look at a million people over a 10 year period doing genome phenome analyses. And we figure with those, we'll see more than 200,000 wellness to disease transitions. And we'll be able to characterize those early markers and know what a given marker indicates with regard to a downstream disease. And we'll begin to think about how we reverse those diseases, cancer, diabetes, chronic heart disease, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, all of these things get opened up to very early diagnosis and a modification of uh, early stage transition and so forth. Now, in the course of doing all of this, we did investigate the marker you mentioned at the beginning of this question, namely uh, a protein marker that seemed only to be present in patients where the tumor had already metastasized or to be present possibly, and this is a little fuzzy, in patients whose tumor normally would have metastasized, mm. that is broken away from the parent tumor and gone to another site in the individual. And of course, these metastases are enormously grave consequences of cancer. And if we could use this early marker to say, we have the potential to metastasize and really go after it early before it has, again, you could think about preventing uh, the kind of chronic disease that, that now is totally uh, unstoppable. So that marker turned out to be uh, present in three major cancers that yep. uh, we saw, it, each of which later went on to metastasize. But the marker was there at an early point to serve as a warning of this is a cancer that may metastasize, so you should reverse it early for sure. Incredible. No, really fascinating. And, you know, again, coming back to sort of your, your network concept and, and how there are many different nodes in these yep. diseases. Yep. And, yeah. Uh, you know, if you take the landscape in one direction, yeah, it might not be the one thing you're looking at, but um, no, I, I think that's fascinating that you're able to highlight these uh, that far ahead of time. And that, that, that data set of a million or so uh, that you're going to be getting into, that's uh, obviously going to open up such a, a plethora of, of its and more data. I mean, I mean as we're talking Lee, about you know cancer, and then you mentioned you know Alzheimer's and diabetes and these other, uh, these obviously they all fall into this this basket of uh, you know this large basket of aging, and uh, clearly you know we, we chatted about aging a couple of years ago. Clearly, um, aging, whether we want to call it health span or healthy aging, whatever the term we want to put behind it nowadays, is an area that we we could use quite a bit more systems thinking in. And again, you know, another paper, um, this one was November 2019, Journal of Gerontology, uh, Multiomic Biologic Age Estimation and its Correlation with Wellness and Disease Phenotypes. Here again, large patient population looking, you know, across the board at, at a variety of uh, environments and, 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 and biomarkers and so forth. Um, talk a little bit about what you learned in this particular paper per biologic age trajectories, because here you went again quite well beyond sort of the traditional 
linear, you know, this biomarker <laughs> right. and so forth. Right. You, you went much broader and deeper. T take us into this one. So the, the uh, paper that we published in the Journal of Psychiatry dealt with the fact that we had uh, individuals in Arafel that extended in range from 21 to 93. What we did was to bin all of those 5,000 patients into 10-year categories. So 21 to 30, 31 to 40, all the way up to 81 to 90. And then what we were able to demonstrate is there was a linear progression as you aged of the loss in control of blood analyte expression patterns, okay? okay. And that was expression patterns for proteins, for metabolites, or for clinical chemistries. And, and to simplify the process, this change in expression pattern could be converted into an algorithm that let us determine the biological age for each person. So the biological age is the age your body says, as opposed to the age your birthday says you are. And the younger the biological age is relative to your chronologic age, the better you're aging. So for example, what we were able to demonstrate is for women, for every year they stayed in this scientific wellness program, they lost a year and a half of biological age. So over a four-year period, you lost six years of biological age. For men, it was 0.8 years, so you lost about three. Uh, but I think what was really striking is when we looked at individuals that had various diseases, every one of them had a biological age well above their chronologic age. And when the disease was resolved in several cases, the biological age went back down below once they returned to mm -hmm. health. So this was a wonderful marker that distinguished wellness and it distinguished the rate at which you were aging. Now, what is really interesting about using metabolites as the foundation for doing the biological age calculation is they actually allowed us to determine the biological age of major organs like the liver, like mm. the kidney, like the immune system, like the metabolic system. And those ages also could be adapted to therapies that optimize them and push them lower than they were if they were inappropriately high. So the idea of biological aging metric is not only does it give you a measure of wellness, it tells you how you can decrease the level of aging. And of course, the reason that can be very important is age itself is the primary uh, major causative factor for most chronic diseases. And if you can suppress your aging, you'll suppress the onset of chronic diseases. So that's the second way using a data-driven approach to health, we can avoid chronic diseases. The first was these metabolites that, or proteins that we saw that were markers of very early transition and the attempt at reversal. And this is just pushing your age down. So you never transition into that um, progression to diabetes or a particular kind of uh, cancer. So I think these, I think that metric is a very important uh, means for following wellness and the aging process. And we hope to push everyone down to a level of aging where they can reasonably hope that their health span will equal their lifespan. So your lifespan is how how long you live. Mm -hmm. Your health span is how long you live in a healthy manner. And we want to be able to push people into the 90s and even hundreds, uh, mentally alert, physically capable, uh, with the potential for community, creativity, activity, uh, ambition, 
still trying to change the world if that's what you want to do. But we'd like to see that health span. I mean, the health span for a lot of people ends in the 60s. Yeah. And we'd like to make sure that that doesn't happen for most people in the future. And, you know, continuing along that uh, line of discussion. So, you know, here I am with my 30 trillion or so cells of 200 and some odd different lineages that make me up. Uh, but there's other stuff living in on or um, among me known as my microbiome. The microbiome, as you mentioned, uh, Lee, is, is part of, of what you're looking at. And, and you published a couple really interesting papers in recent years. One uh, that, that stood out, Nature Metabolism, February 2021, talking about gut microbiome pattern reflects healthy aging and predict survival in humans. And then there's other really interesting one from um, the, the British Medical Journal quite recently in April of 2022, uh, talking about uh, heterogeneity and statin responses is, again, looking at the, the human gut microbiome, uh, an interesting sort of pharmaco, you know, pharmacokinetic component there to to uh, to our microbiome working with us. Um, talk a little bit about some of what you're learning here, because I noticed, you know, you, you look at, again, thousands of individuals, the microbiome is a very large universe in itself uh, of, of cells and other uh, little organisms that like to colonize us. What are you learning in terms of both uh, health and, and, and aging in terms of the microbiome in the, in the current program? So again, the microbiome is the colonies of bacteria that live in your gut, yep. that interface with your food, have a big influence on diet health in that regard and interface with all the drugs you take. And we can talk about what we learned about statins in just a moment. But what the, the, the key to the gut microbiome is when it's diverse, you're generally healthy in your gut microbiome. And so one of the first papers that we did was a demonstration that we could quantify 11 metabolites in the blood, and they gave us a very accurate estimate of the gut microbiome and, and its diversity. And the reason that's important is we can go to our blood bank and we can look at bloods years in the past where we didn't have microbiome samples, and we can study the microbiome in terms of its diversity and so forth. And that's turned out to be very important. But a second study we did, which you mentioned, which I found really fascinating, was to study people that ranged from 60 years of age to uh, almost 90. We studied 9,000 of them. We looked, quantified their gut microbiomes across those periods of time. And what we were able to demonstrate is if you were healthy, your gut microbiome aged in a really unique way across that period of time. Number one, you lost the major gut microbiota that were characteristic of you in your 20s and 30s and 40s. You lost those completely. And number two, you replace those with unique microbiota for each different healthy person. So every 80 year old that was healthy had a unique profile of micro, uh, of the gut microbiome, presumably selected because that's what they needed with regard to uh, metabolism and all of these things and in their uh, old age. Now in contrast, if you weren't healthy, neither of those things happened you retained the gut microbiota of your 20s and 30s and 40s, and you didn't in any way uniquely differentiate. And what made us think that these observations were very true is in the 80s, the people that uh, were unhealthy died four times as frequently as the people that were healthy. So, one of the fascinating things is, can we learn to engineer our gut microbiome in the future to facilitate healthy aging? Can we take yet another approach to optimizing the aging process and ensuring that you move into your 90s or later 
healthy and active and all of these kinds of things. And then the final study we, we did, the one that you mentioned, was to look at the effect of the gut microbiome on uh, statins. So let me say that number one, there were four different uh, categories of microbiome populations that we ended up characterizing in this paper. And what these four microbiota in different combinations did was either enhance the good effects of statins, for example, enhance the ability to lower your LDL cholesterol to make you more heart healthy, or it could intensify one of the major complications of statins, which is transition into type two diabetes. Yeah. And these four things work together to either amplify those effects or minimize those effects. So there was a combination of two microbiota, which for example, made it ideal for lowering cholesterol and had very little effect on, uh, on transferring one to type two diabetes. So the important point is most of us, when we get in our 70s and 80s and 90s are taking uh, two or three or four or five drugs, all of those drugs have to go through the gut microbiota. All of them will be affected by this. And as we learn how to optimize the behavior of the microbiota with regard to optimizing the functions you'd like the drugs to carry out, then we're going to be able to optimize health in more effective ways. So it opens up really exciting new possibilities people just haven't thought about before. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, it's, it, it, you know, you talk about interventions, and we'll 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 do that in a little bit. But I thought you know one other really interesting thing. I thought you could say a couple words about this. Um, later on in the book, I think it was the chapter eleven, and when you're talking about the path forward and sort of this new model of 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 sort of wellness transitions, disease reversal, uh, as this is what we're heading into here, as we really begin to understand uh, this data at this much deeper level. You talk, and you actually publish in, in Nature Biotechnology, this really interesting paper on long COVID. And you sort of look at it as um, sort of a, an interesting microcosm disease, let's say, where everything that you're just mentioning in the sense, okay, we have an infection that leads to this syndrome that has an inflammatory component and an autoimmune component. And then all the stuff that happens from that, whether it's vascular, talk, just say a couple of words about why you focused on, I mean, because it, clearly it made a lot of sense that, wow, here is something that is, um, you know, much more acute, let's say, uh, giving us some, some really interesting ideas on how we think about, uh, once again, these complex disease networks. Say say a couple words about this paper too, if you would. Well, I'll tell you, we we actually published three papers, one in Nature Biotech and yeah. two Nature's yeah. and Cell. But the reason that... Uh, COVID was such an interesting model system to study is its immediacy and imperative demand that things be done quickly. Resources were made available. It was possible to actually collaborate with hospital systems that yep. ordinarily would take a year or two years to figure out whether they wanted to do anything with you. And in a matter of weeks, have a clinical trial set up an agreement and all the, the the papers signed and be on our way. It was a unique opportunity to study a really pressing crisis that had come into life. And what, of course, is interesting about COVID is it's an acute viral infection. Right. And that means it really impacts the immune system in interesting ways. It impacts your metabolism in interesting ways. And it has very short-term consequences of the classic signs of COVID yeah. and long-term consequences of long COVID with complications in maybe five or six or seven different potential systems, your heart, your lungs, your gut, your the nervous system was one thing that was 
was greatly affected. So we saw this as an immediate opportunity to study at the same time an acute infectious disease that transitioned into a chronic, very long-term disease. And the approach that we took was to use our genome-phenome analysis that I've described earlier, uh, sequencing the source code of life, your genome, and then carrying out these uh, detailed phenome analyses of proteins and metabolites and clinical chemistries and the gut microbiome and uh, all of these different things. And the one thing we did add to that is very deep immune analyses. So what we did was actually at each blood draw, and the blood draws were at admission at the end of the first 10 days, that's when much of the acute disease was over. And then we looked at something that was three to six months downstream to see if there were long-term consequences. So at each of those bleedings, we took 5,000 white blood cells and we quantified by single cell analysis their transcriptome, uh, uh, 250 cell surface proteins, and, and uh, roughly 100 secreted proteins. And what that allowed us to do is precisely define the type of each of the 5,000 cells and their state of differentiation. And what this did was define relative contributions of innate and adaptive immunity. And we came to understand just how the immune system was responding to different aspects of, of uh, the acute disease and the long-term disease. And one of the really striking effects of long-term disease was the emergence of really striking autoimmune responses where the immune system actually attacks cells in the body itself. But I would say if we, we had to have uh, one major conclusion that came from all of this, it, it would be the last paper in Cell, we were, we were able to show some major features that occurred right at the admission of the person to hospital that allowed us to predict unerringly whether they get long COVID or not. Mm. And that is really an important contribution. So this, this had to do with the presence of the viral RNA and its concentration. It had to do with the activation of oncogenes that are intrinsically present in our mouth and so forth. It had to do with the presence or not of diabetes. It was a hmm. major factor in determining these kinds of things. So it was these kinds of factors that let us make predictions about which patients if you wanted to do long COVID, were the most likely candidates for following all the way through to uh, long COVID. But what it did was it allowed us to take a disease, COVID, and to dissect it in molecular terms, in terms of biological networks, their dynamics, their changing uh, progression, uh, it and at a detail and a level of specificity that had never been done for a disease before. And we're now beginning to apply exactly these kinds of approaches to the four major chronic diseases that we deal with as, as humans. These are diabetes, and we're ready to start a trial using exactly that same strategy to study the entire uh, nature, the 15 years of diabetes, and we can tell you how we can actually do that over a four-year period rather than a 15-year period. Uh, but we'll get, I think, over that four-year period, we'll learn more about the entire life history of diabetes than we've learned in the last 50 years. And we'll uh, apply the same to, we're picking out a single type of cancer for interesting reasons, acute myelogenous leukemia, which is uh, uh, cancer that usually kills patients very quickly. And then we're going to do the same for heart failure and the same for Alzheimer's. So, and part of the reason for really attacking those four diseases is they're 
four of the very major chronic diseases, which cost 86.8% of our healthcare dollars each yeah. year and last year, that was $4 trillion. And suppose in 10 or 15 years, we can cut the transition to those chronic diseases in half. You talk about saving trillions of dollars in healthcare. And it's that kind of savings that's going to be one of the most compelling arguments for shifting healthcare from its current focus on disease to a focus on wellness and prevention. And we do it through this uh, data-driven health approach that I've described here. Mm -hmm. And again, continuing from that, um, you know, chapter five um, in the book, uh, A New Way to Think About How Old We Are, again, this is the, the aging chapter, but you talk, you, you mentioned in this uh, chapter, uh, there's a piece that says, you know, in the long run, it's likely that combinations of compounds and perhaps different combinations for people with different genetic profiles will be the most efficient. This is speaking healthy aging, but I think this is, applies across what, everything you're saying here. And, and, you know, whether we're talking, you know, the themes of, pharmacogenomics or nutrigenomics or whatever you want to call it, um, you're bringing in, uh, beyond, you're going beyond the traditional single magic bullet approach that sort of the industry, with the exception of maybe HIV, has been based on. And I know you've published about this in the past in terms of, you know, when you're looking at these complex disease networks, uh, okay, you don't have to nudge every node, but you have to understand, you know, okay, there may be a few places we have to intervene here. What do ideal interventions, Lee, look like to you as we look out, as you have this data and you start thinking about creative ways to interfere? I mean, clearly, you have some really cool people that are, you know, over the, in the editorials, you know, fo folks like George Church, who's really into genetic engineering, and Sarah Gottfried from around the corner here at Sydney Kimmel, uh, food and hormones and all that. What, what, looking forward, five years out, 10 years out, what are these ideal anti, um, you know, pro wellness interventions look like to you well let's take the case of aging cuz i think in many ways ironically that's a simple straightforward case so what is true about aging is it has some of the most conserved mechanisms in all multicelled organisms that is to say discoveries we've made on uh yeast actually apply all the way up to humans. Discoveries we've made in the nematode on aging can apply to humans. The mouse uh, studies have real implications for humans too that are very exciting. And one of the things that we've discovered is, as is true of most complex events in biology, there is a hierarchy of three or so control factors that actually regulate all of the different hallmarks of aging, which are ineffective proteosis, the, the creation of senescent cells, and on and on. There are eight or nine major hallmarks of aging. So the really can and and these this threefold network again seems to be present in the simplest organisms all the way up to the highest organisms. So the really exciting idea is, can we get drugs that can hit these very high level things? They'll knock out a whole battery of these hallmarks of aging. And that's what drugs like rapamycin and uh, metformin seem to be able to do. I mean, I think there's really exciting evidence that suggests these could have major effects in, in decreasing the rate of aging. And where we are today is major human clinical trials are being carried out with these drugs. And obviously, studying aging is a non-trivial clinical trial. Sure. And you, you can't wait until people die and then extrapolate back. You rather have to look at Fragility, which is a hallmark of aging that increases as we get older. But the idea is in uh, perhaps five years, we'll have some really compelling evidence that there may be drugs that can really facilitate 
just as I described earlier, the change in slope of your aging. So it's significantly decreased. So I think the key for drugs then is to be able to hit high level control nodes mm -hmm. that have big impacts on the phenotype that comes out uh, at the bottom of the regulatory cycle. Um, Lee, say uh, a couple words while we have you about uh, your paper from 2021 on uh, deep phenotyping during pregnancy um, for the delivery of predictive imprinted medicine, because here, you know, again, two different areas of life, um, but again, the, the data in terms of the genomics and the exposome and everything else, you know, equally relevant. Uh, talk about why you wrote this paper and a little bit of what uh, potentially we can learn by utilizing these tools at the very beginnings of life uh, for later on in life. Well, if if you look at human development, I'd argue that there are really major points in human development of data deserts where there's okay. very little information available. So I would say Early childhood development is one area we know very little about, and it's utterly ripe, and it's something I'd like to get to very soon. A second area that is really critical is pregnancy. I mean, here you transform the life of the mother, you create another organism. And what I can say is we're now in the midst of a P200 project where we have about uh, 200 pregnant women that were taking all the way through pregnancy doing genome phenome analyses. And we're mm. about halfway through with that. And I think we'll have something equivalent to what Aravale did in giving us a high level look at wellness and healthy aging and so forth. I think we'll come to understand once we've done this analysis, and this is being done with uh, uh, Yoel Sanofsky at, at the University of Pittsburgh, I think, I, I think we'll come to understand more about pregnancy by a factor of 10 than we've learned in all the rest of recorded history. And it's, it's all there waiting to be revealed. And, and we'll be able to follow both the trajectory of the mother and the trajectory of the fetus as well through all of the details and molecular insights that we gain and so forth. So this is a data desert that we're really going after. I'd say a third data desert that's just ripe for exploitation is menstruation. Mm -hmm. And I think people have gotten really false impressions about the undesirability of hormones to be able to reverse staggering consequences for the women with regard to menstruation. And again, that's something that we want to study with this very dense, deep uh, phenotyping that I've talked about and everything. Mm -hmm. So th these, these data deserts are something that's very important to get to when, of course, Persuading NIH to move in these new directions is tough these days because NIH is very used to saying, this is what we want and we expect you to reply to what we want rather than proposing big, new, ambitious proposals. I remember in, in uh, uh, 2013 going to NIH and talking with the leaders there about our new um, uh, P100 program that was a precursor to the Aravale program mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. genome phenome analyses and having NIH say, NIH at that time is only interested in disease. There's no way we'd ever fund a program on wellness. And, you know, I think moving into these new areas requires a determined optimism and, and a, a, a need to explore funding from every possible source you can exploit. Absolutely. And um, you know, along those notes, uh, you know, obviously you, know, you, as I mentioned in the bio, you know, you 
have been responsible for the creation of uh, some of the most important tools that uh, our industry is based on nowadays. Uh, we have the new tools now coming out of the woodwork. You you write a lot about them in, in the book in terms of the artificial intelligence. Uh, we've had a lot of groups on talking about what they're doing with AI, uh, had a couple uh, shows on, on digital twins and the potential of that technology. Um, what what else technologically gets you excited uh, that's maybe maybe not optimized yet, but coming down the road the next uh, uh, five years, 10 years, whether it be in silico clinical studies or distributed clinical model, distributed wellness studies, whatever you want to call them. What, what else gets you excited as you, you think about these possibilities in the coming years? Well, I, I would say there are three things. First, I think this human phenome initiative of a million persons would drive the development of phenomic technologies just exactly as the first human genome project drove the technology of DNA sequencing. And over a 20 year period, it decreased the cost of sequencing by 10 to the seventh. The first genome cost maybe a billion or more. A genome today can probably be done for perhaps a hundred dollars. That's a staggering change in the cost. And the phenome to do a good analysis is probably five or six thousand dollars a year if you do two different samples as we do. And what I'm hoping is the phenomics can bring down the cost of those things by at least three orders of magnitude. So we wouldn't be talking about six thousand, we'd be talking about six dollars. And that's something that insurance and uh, other things could readily accommodate in this whole thing. I think a second area that's really important are the digital health devices. That is the ability to capture activity, to capture sleep, to capture stress, to capture uh, you name it, basically. I think these devices are really exciting because they give us the ability to continuously monitor the human individual and actually to interpolate their results into the much less frequent blood results that we get so we can make predictions about what some of the uh, digital health measurements actually infer with regard to diet and activity and, and stress and the like and so forth. But I think the third area, and frankly, it's the area I'm most excited about, is AI. Yep. And I think AI is utterly going to transform medicine in every way. I mean, uh, I think one, the large language models that we see coming out are going to have the potential for utterly reorganizing how hospitals have to manage all the complex procedures that are managed by people. For example, if a patient comes in and all of a sudden you realize the one specialist doctor doesn't know enough about the brain and the kidney and the heart, and the, how do you send that person to the right people at the hospital? It is a non-trivial task for hospitals. And I would say large language models could take those kind of things together with the capacity of a hospital and instantaneously write out a schedule and formulate those kind of things. So I, I think just the management of hospital procedures is one thing. I think the second thing is when we did Airveil initially, we were able to show that there were thousands of statistical correlations between data bits in different of the six different data types, major data types we measured. And those data bits, when taken to the literature, led to actionable possibilities that could improve wellness or avoid uh, disease. And what I would say is with the new uh, million person initiative, we'll come up with 10,000 or more of those actionable possibilities. So it'll be absolutely mandatory that AI delivers them to the physician, not only explaining what the actionable possibility is and what the patient has to do, but justifying it in terms of scientific merit and everything. 
because you know the doctors aren't just going to do what they're told right. they're not going to they're not going to have things for their patients that they aren't convinced are scientifically validated so the ai has to do both a description of what the it is and a uh, validation of why it should be done and then the thing i'm most excited about is i think we can actually educate large language models by using digital twins and knowledge graphs and PubMed so that they focus on exactly the things you need them to focus on when we bring the complex pattern of phenomic data from a mm. single patient and put it in and they'll record all of the gaps and they'll prioritize the actionable possibilities yeah. that can be recommended to overcome the limitations. And this is like having a physician that knows all aspects of medicine uh, collectively. And, and that's operationally what AI is going to bring to the physician, not the decision-making choice, because that has to be in the physician's hands, but the tools to make a really informed choice with regard to a given patient about how that health can be optimized. And I see this as a tool like no other that is going to lead to, you know, the biggest revolution in the history of medicine when we convert from a healthcare that's all about wellness and prevention from a healthcare that's all about disease. And I'll just make a word more with regard to terms of uh, sustainability of healthcare systems. I'll say unequivocally, there's no sustainable healthcare system in the world today. And the reason for that is it's focused on disease. Yeah. And all you can do with disease is make their treatment more and more costly. This is perfect. I um, I really appreciate your time, Lee. Um, this was uh, it's it's well been... it's it's always fun talking with you, Fyra. Yeah, it's 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 really a great time. It's it's so impressive to see the transition um, that you've made over the last couple of years since we last chatted. I'm going to continue to to follow you and um, you know everything that you and well, your we'll team talk are doing. in a few more years and we'll have yeah. some big additional transitions by then. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, for everybody that is going to be listening to this particular episode of our show across the various podcast networks or watching on the YouTube channel, again, you've been listening to the amazing Dr. Lee Hood, co-founder, chief strategy officer, professor, Institute of Systems Biology, chief executive officer, Phenome Health. Um, Lee, again, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while. Obviously, thank you for everything you're doing there. And as we like to say on our show, uh, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for everybody via what you've been doing. Really, really great story. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Ira.